Bonjour, bienvenue à cette conférence de presse virtuelle. With us today, Dr. Theresa Tam, Chief Medical Officer, and Dr. Howard New, administrateur en chef adjoint de la santé publique, euh, qui vont présenter les plus récentes courbes. Euh, alors, on va commencer avec euh, des commentaires des médecins et ensuite on prendra des questions au téléphone. Dr. Tam, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. And hello, everyone. Bonjour à tous et à tous. Today, we'll provide the latest update on the national epidemiology and modeling work that informs the ongoing management of COVID-19 in Canada. Coming out of the holiday season, we're seeing how quickly Omicron has changed the landscape of the epidemic in Canada. In just a few short weeks, Omicron has spread faster and further than any previous variant. At the same time, we're seeing Canadians rise and adapt to the latest challenges by updating their vaccine protection, improving their mask quality and fit, and keeping up with multiple other layers of protection to reduce their risk of exposure and spreading the virus. Public health has also had to adapt in the face of the explosive spread of Omicron cases that has exceeded the testing capacity in many areas of the country. Although some of our earlier indicators, like daily case counts, are now strikingly high, while at the same time significantly underestimating the true number of new infections. This update puts more emphasis on some of the many other indicators that continue to be useful for monitoring current trends and predicting longer range trajectories. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Aujourd'hui, nous ferons le point sur les travaux d'épidémiologie et de modélisation effectués aux pays qui orientent la gestion continue de la COVID-19 au Canada. À la suite de la période des fêtes, on constate la vitesse à laquelle le variant Omicron a transformé le contexte de la pandémie au Canada. En à peine quelques semaines, Omicron s'est propagé plus vite et plus largement que tout autre variant antérieur. Au même moment, on voit les Canadiens réagir et s'adapter aux plus récents défis en mettant en jour leur protection vaccinale, en améliorant la qualité à l'ajustement des masques qu'ils portent et en maintenant d'autres couches de protection destinées à réduire le risque d'exposition au virus et de propagation de celui-ci. La santé publique, elle aussi, a dû s'adapter face à la propagation fulgurante des cas d'Omicron qui a débordé la capacité de dépistage dans de nombreuses régions du pays. Bien que certains des premiers indicateurs, tels que le nombre quotidien des cas, soient actuellement extrêmement élevés et que le nombre réel de nouvelles infections soit considérablement sous-estimé, la présente séance est plutôt axée sur d'autres indicateurs qui demeurent utiles à la surveillance des tendances et à la prévision des trajectoires à long terme. Slide one. Since the last epidemiology and modeling update in December, despite being underestimated, current national case counts of over 37,500 new cases reported daily are far exceeding all previous peaks of the pandemic. The sudden spike in Omicron infections has daily case counts now trending far above the daily counts for severe outcomes. And while international surveillance shows that severity trends do not rise at the same explosive rate as cases, the record high volume of cases associated with the Omicron surge is nevertheless expected to heavily impact hospitals. Although there are likely to be continued challenges before we hope to see improvement, caution and perseverance will help to get us through this difficult period sooner and mitigate the impacts on our severely strained health system. Diapositive 2. Avec des taux d'infection très élevés qui défient ou dépassent les capacités de dépistage dans une grande partie du pays, un éventail d'autres indicateurs tels que la positivité des tests de laboratoire sont, sont utiles pour surveiller l'activité de la maladie au niveau, au niveau de la population. Actuellement, le pourcentage de positivité des tests de laboratoire est de 28 signifiant que le virus est détecté dans plus d'un test sur quatre. Bien que de nombreuses juridictions accordent la priorité de dépistage aux personnes et aux populations les plus à risque de maladies graves ou d'exposition, le taux de positivité très élevé actuel montre que la COVID-19 s'est largement propagée 
et que le nombre de cas sous-estime le véritable fardeau de l'infection dans la population en général. Néanmoins, le suivi de la tendance en ce qui concerne cet indicateur peut nous aider à déterminer si la COVID-19 demeure très répandue ou si elle commence à s'affaiblir dans certaines régions du pays. En même temps, d'autres indicateurs continuent d'être utilisés en parallèle pour surveiller d'autres aspects, notamment les tendances en matière de gravité de la maladie. Slide 3. That Omicron is the most contagious variant observed to date is evident from these curves, showing the sudden increase in the proportion of cases due to Omicron shown by the red curve on the right. First reported in Canada in late November, Omicron has rapidly replaced Delta to become the predominant variant circulating in Canada as of mid-December. Dear Positive Cat, les tendances liées aux hospitalisations sont indiquées pour les six provinces canadiennes les plus populeuses. Mais contrairement aux vagues précédentes de la pandémie, pendant lesquelles la propagation de la maladie était généralement bien maîtrisée dans certaines juridictions plus petites, la hausse des cas attribuables aux variants Omicron est généralisée au pays. Bien que les données indiquent que le risque d'hospitalisation est plus faible pour le variant Omicron, que pour le Delta, des cas de maladies graves surviennent toujours avec Omicron et les répercussions sur le système de santé et d'autres secteurs peuvent être substantielles. Ceci s'explique par la hausse des hospitalisations et des admissions aux soins intensifs ainsi que par l'augmentation du nombre d'employés malades et devant s'isoler. Déjà, le nombre énorme de cas a commencé à stimuler une augmentation des tendances des cas de maladies graves à l'échelle nationale. Ces augmentations sont plus évidentes en Ontario et au Québec, qui ont été les premiers à connaître la poussée d'Omicron, mais la plupart des régions du pays commencent à voir ou devraient s'attendre à voir de fortes augmentations de nombre quotidien d'hospitalisations au cours des prochaines semaines. Depuis notre dernière mise à jour, le nombre de personnes atteintes de la COVID-19 traitées dans nos hôpitaux a plus que quadruplé pour atteindre une moyenne de plus de 6 779 hospitalisations par jour, tandis que le nombre de personnes se trouvant aux soins intensifs a doublé pour atteindre une moyenne de plus de 884 par jour et 82 décès ont été signalés quotidiennement. Maintenir les taux d'infection à de faibles niveaux reste essentiel afin d'atténuer l'augmentation des tendances de maladies graves autant que possible au cours des prochaines semaines. Slide 5. The incidence of reported cases is higher across all age groups than at any time previously during the pandemic. As opposed to previous weeks, when rates were highest among 5 to 11-year-olds who were just becoming eligible for vaccination, incidence rates are currently highest among adults aged 20 to 39 years, with Omicron's greater ability to evade prior immunity from infection and vaccines Cases are now increasing in all age groups. Dear Positive Sis, Bien que le nombre global de cas entraîne une hausse de taux, euh, des taux d'hospitalisation dans tous les groupes d'âge, la répartition par âge des cas hospitalisés est similaire aux vagues précédentes de la pandémie avec les taux d'hospitalisation les plus élevés étant observés chez les Canadiens plus âgés. Au cours des derniers mois, les cas de maladies graves y compris le nombre d'hospitalisations et d'admissions aux soins intensifs, ont été les plus importants chez les adultes de 60 ans et plus, et particulièrement chez eux de 80 ans et plus. En fin de compte, l'impact à l'échelle de la population dépendra du nombre global de cas entraînant une maladie grave, dont tout ce que nous pouvons faire pour ralentir la propagation contribue à atténuer l'impact individuel et collectif. Chez les groupes d'âge plus jeunes, les cas parmi les nourrissons âgés de moins d'un an sont presque sept fois plus susceptibles d'être hospitalisés que les enfants âgés d'un à quatre ans. Mais, bien que le nombre d'hospitalisations ait augmenté chez les enfants comparativement aux vagues précédentes, il demeure faible dans l'ensemble 
représentant moins de 1 des cas signalés chez les enfants de moins de 5 ans. Heureusement, chez les enfants, les taux d'admission en soins intensifs continuent d'être faibles. Néanmoins, en maintenant les taux d'infection les plus bas que possible, nous pouvons réduire le nombre de maladies graves chez les enfants. Slide 7. Omicron's rapid rate of spread is likely due to a combination of inherent characteristics of the virus that makes it more transmissible and increased ability to evade prior immunity from past infection and vaccination. Similarly, Omicron's lower severity profile as seen in international and Canadian data is likely due to characteristics of the virus and protection from severe disease as a result of vaccination and or prior infection. This is supported by the fact that those with two doses of vaccine are less likely to be admitted to hospital, and this protection is increased with an additional mRNA vaccine dose of either Moderna or Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines. While considerably lower proportion of Omicron cases are being hospitalized compared to Delta, severe illness does occur with Omicron, and the impact on the health system and other sectors is expected to be substantial. Hence, vaccination, including getting an mRNA booster dose as eligible, continues to be important in combination with timed and targeted public health measures and individual protective practices for slowing COVID-19 infection rates and help to reduce impact on healthcare capacity. As well, despite a high number of outbreaks being reported in long-term care homes and seniors' residences, Preliminary evidence indicates that these outbreaks are associated with less severe illness and the number of deaths remains low. However, as seen with hospital outbreaks, these outbreaks can involve a high number of cases among staff, which is contributing to reduced staffing levels. Dear Positive Wit, on two, plus que 72 million de doses de vaccins contre la COVID-19 ont été administrées au Canada depuis le début de la vaccination à la mi-décembre 2020. Cependant, bien que les Canadiens âgés de 12 ans et plus ont eu une couverture vaccinale de plus de 83 ayant reçu au moins deux doses de vaccin, la couverture est beaucoup plus faible chez les enfants âgés de 5 à 11 ans qui sont récemment devenus éligibles à la vaccination, 48 d'entre eux ayant reçu une dose. Au total, il y a plus de 6,5 millions de Canadiens présentement admissibles à la vaccination qui ne sont pas encore vaccinés ou qui ont reçu moins de deux doses de vaccin contre la COVID-19. Slide 9. In terms of additional doses, 11 million COVID-19 vaccines third doses have been given, the majority of which are booster doses. While we are making progress in updating protection for those in higher risk groups, including older adults, we need to continue efforts to increase vaccine coverage to enhance protection for everyone we can. As seen in this chart, a considerable proportion of Canadians who have received at least two doses still need an additional dose to restore protection that may have waned since completing their primary series. Dear Positive This, le fait d'être entièrement vacciné ayant reçu au moins deux doses de vaccin continue d'offrir une bonne protection contre les maladies graves nécessitant l'hospitalisation. Dans ce graphique, la forme de la courbe de ces cas hospitalisés chez les personnes non vaccinées concorde étroitement avec l'incidence globale des hospitalisations pendant la montée à la chute de la vague entraînée par Delta et vers la hausse d'Omicron. À l'inverse, le taux d'hospitalisation des Canadiens vaccinés est resté à un faible niveau tout au long de la vague Delta et commence tout juste à augmenter avec le début de la vague Omicron. Il est important de noter que selon les données d'hôpitaux sélectionnées jusqu'à la fin décembre, la majorité des adultes hospitalisés avec la COVID-19 étaient des personnes atteintes d'une maladie grave liée à la COVID, tandis que jusqu'à un tiers ou plus avec la COVID-19 étaient admis pour d'autres raisons. Néanmoins, ces tendances montrent clairement que le fait d'être vacciné avec deux doses ou plus offre une protection élevée. Du début novembre au début décembre, 
Lorsque Delta était toujours le variant prédominant au Canada, les personnes non vaccinées étaient 19 fois plus susceptibles d'être hospitalisées. Alors que l'administration des doses de rappel se poursuit, être à jour avec nos vaccins contre la COVID-19 devrait préserver cet avantage de protection. Slide 11. This updated longer range forecast shows how the Omicron wave could evolve in the coming weeks as cases continue to accelerate across the country. It is important to note that this trajectory estimates the true number of daily cases as opposed to reported cases that may be occurring in Canada each day. Due to constraints on testing capacity, these numbers are much higher than can be detected in fact, exceeds the number of cases reported in the surveillance data shown here as orange dots. The two scenarios shown on the slide, both of which incorporate the impact of booster doses, suggest that the Omicron variant could cause a large wave that may peak in January and then recede into February. However, it's important to remember that these are modeled scenarios and the timing of the peak is likely to vary across the country. The red line trajectory shows that without recent strengthening of public health measures in many jurisdictions, the Omicron wave could have peaked at about 300,000 actual daily cases. Whereas the blue line trajectory shows that with the recent implementation of stronger measures, we could experience a peak that is lower with about 170,000 actual daily cases. These scenarios highlight that while combined public health measures and booster doses could help reduce the size of the Omicron wave, in either scenario, the true number of daily cases driven by extremely high transmissibility of the Omicron variant could still vastly exceed anything we have experienced to date during this pandemic. Dear Positive News, Cette nouvelle prévision modélisée portant sur les nouvelles hospitalisations quotidiennes prévues nous aide à comprendre comment la hausse exponentielle des cas pourrait affecter notre système de santé au cours des prochaines semaines, en supposant que le nombre de cas d'Omicron suivra la trajectoire de la ligne inférieure de la diapositive précédente, compte tenu de la mise en œuvre récente des mesures de santé publique dans de nombreux endroits du pays, cette prévision montre les deux trajectoires possibles concernant les nouvelles hospitalisations quotidiennes. La trajectoire de la ligne jaune foncée supérieure montre l'impact potentiel sur les hospitalisations si le taux d'hospitalisation pour Omicron était aussi élevé que Delta. La trajectoire de la ligne bleue inférieure montre l'impact potentiel si le taux d'hospitalisation était de 40 celui de Delta, conformément aux preuves émergentes d'une réduction de la gravité de la maladie au Canada et à l'étranger. Ces scénarios portent à croire que même si nous suivons la prévision plus faible concernant le nombre de cas et le taux d'hospitalisation nettement inférieur du variant Omicron, les nouvelles hospitalisations quotidiennes pourraient tout de même dépasser les pics historiques représentés par la ligne T horizontale verte en raison du grand nombre de cas qui pourraient survenir. Il est important de souligner que cette prévision ne reflète que les nouvelles admissions quotidiennes à l'hôpital pour la COVID-19 et non le nombre total de personnes hospitalisées avec une maladie liée à la COVID-19 lors d'une journée. Mais quoi qu'il en soit, nous nous attendons à ce que le nombre d'hospitalisations quotidiennes constitue un lourd fardeau pour le système de santé au cours des prochaines semaines. Slide 13, experiences of other countries that also experience an Omicron surge provide additional insights into how the pandemic may evolve in the weeks to come. Countries like the United Kingdom and United States that experience a sudden and very steep rise in Omicron cases also experience a sharp rise in hospitalizations. However, given the lower severity profile of Omicron, hospitalizations haven't increased at the same explosive rate as cases. Nevertheless, the sudden acceleration and enormous volume of cases associated with an Omicron surge puts an intense strain on hospitals over several weeks.
and adds to longer lasting impacts, such as extended backlogs and strained workforce. With early signs that the surging cases and hospitalizations may have peaked in parts of the US and UK, it is hoped that the heaviest impacts will soon be over in these countries. Likewise, if Canada's trajectory continues to follow a similar path, we are hopeful that cases will soon peak. Dear, dear Positive 14, alors que le Canada pourrait attendre un pic prononcé suivi d'un déclin de nombre de cas dans les semaines à venir, étant donné que l'activité de la maladie dépasse de loin les pics précédents, même la descente de cette courbe sera considérable. Avec plusieurs semaines d'activité très intense attendues, nous devons faire de notre mieux dès maintenant pour limiter l'ampleur de la flambée d'Omicron afin de préserver les systèmes de santé et les fonctions critiques de la société. En pratique, nous devons continuer à, premièrement, être à jour avec nos vaccins contre la COVID-19, y compris recevoir une dose de rappel lorsqu'on est, on est éligible. Les vaccins A, A, R, R, N, M, Pfizer, BioNTech ou Moderna sont efficaces comme dose de rappel, alors ayez confiance en acceptant le vaccin qui vous est proposé. Deuxièmement, limitez les contacts personnels aux membres immédiats de même résidence dans la mesure de possible et finalement, utilisez systématiquement des couches de protection personnelle pour réduire les risques d'exposition et de propagation du virus. En suivant, en suivant les conseils locaux de santé publique, portant un masque facial de bonne qualité et bien ajusté et maintenir une bonne ventilation. Merci. Thank you, Miigwech. So I'm just going to repeat the last slide, slide 14. So while Canada could see a sharp peak and decline in cases in the coming weeks, given disease activity far exceeds previous peaks, even the downside of this curve could be considerable. With several weeks of very intense activity expected to come, we need to do our best now to limit the size of the Omicron surge in order to maintain the health system and critical functions of society. Practically speaking, we need to continue to, one, get up to date with COVID-19 vaccines, including getting a booster dose when eligible. Either the Pfizer-BioNTech or Moderna mRNA vaccines are effective as boosters. So please feel confident in accepting whichever vaccine is offered to you. Secondly, limiting in-person contacts to immediate household members as much as you can. And thirdly, consistently use layers of personal protection to reduce the risk of exposure and spreading the virus by following local public health advice, wearing a good quality and snug fitting face mask and maintaining good ventilation. So thank you. Merci, Megwidge. Happy to take questions. Oui, donc on va passer aux questions. On en a, on a environ jusqu'à midi 30 au maximum. Donc, opérateur, c'est à vous. Merci. Thank you. For questions, please press star 1 on the device's keypad. Pour toute question, faites étoile 1 sur votre appareil. La première question nous vient de Raymond Filion, TVA. À vous la parole. Merci, bonjour. Je me demandais si avec la progression d'Omicron combinée à la vaccination, est-ce que ça pourrait permettre au Canada d'atteindre l'immunité collective? Et si oui, à quel moment Omicron pourrait devenir endémique? Ah, merci pour la question. C'est peu plus compliqué que, que ça parce que euh, avec Omicron et les autres variants euh, de, 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 du virus, on sait peut-être pour euh, Omicron, on peut avoir peut-être une, une certaine euh, immunité pour un bout de temps, mais euh, peut-être que ce n'est pas euh, une protection contre les autres variants, les autres souches euh, de, du virus. Donc, euh, ça, ça, ça peut aider un peu pour un bout de temps, mais ce n'est pas vraiment à long terme pour la comédie euh, l'immunité collective. Euh, donc, aussi avec euh, les vaccins, on voit que les vaccins continuent à être très efficaces euh, pour euh, pro se protéger contre les, les maladies graves, mais peut-être pas comme, euh, par exemple, avec le variant Omicron, contre, comme on dit, l'infection et la, 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 la transmission en communauté. Donc, euh, c'est difficile à, à dire quand on, on va peut-être atteindre, comme on dit, euh, une immunité euh, collective. Euh, je pense que euh, c'est toujours une, une, une question de combiner tous les outils à notre, à notre disposition, les, les vaccins, 
mais aussi avec euh, toujours les, les bonnes couches de protection, les mesures de santé publique, aussi euh, la protection, protection individuelle. Et je pense qu'on va voir euh, euh, dans les semaines et les mois à venir qu'est-ce qu'on doit faire pour trouver un équilibre, comment on, on peut comme dit, avoir le bon fonctionnement de la société avec euh, un certain niveau de transmission et aussi peut-être on peut dire morbidité et mortalité dans la population, on peut accepter avec, avec toutes les, les mesures et aussi les outils à notre disposition. Merci. Oui, euh, en suivi, j'aimerais vous parler de la dose de rappel, la troisième dose. Selon vous, est-ce qu'il faut l'administrer aux gens qui ont contracté la COVID-19 dès la fin de leurs symptômes ou c'est préférable d'attendre? Certains parlent de trois mois. C'est quoi votre position là-dessus? Bon, c'est une bonne question. Euh, on sait que notre comité consultatif euh, euh, national de l'immunisation est en train d'examiner toutes les données probantes euh, et les expériences euh, ici au Canada, mais aussi à travers euh, le monde. Et euh, ce que je peux vous dire euh, maintenant, c'est qu'on sait qu'avec une infection, bah, par exemple avec Omicron, ça donne une certaine comme dit, protection immunité contre le, le, le variant Omicron pour un bout de temps. Mais on ne sait pas exactement c'est quoi la durabilité de, de, de la protection immunité contre une certaine variant, comme, par exemple Omicron. Donc, euh, je pense que si on veut donner une dose de rappel, on veut donner avec un intervalle, euh, peut-être euh, le bon intervalle pour avoir assuré euh, la, la meilleure comme dit, protection et l'immunité robuste et durable. Moi, personnellement, je pense avec ce que je connais, euh, euh, on peut peut-être attendre quelques semaines euh, après une infection avec euh, le, le variant euh, Omicron, mais euh, j'attends aussi euh, le, vraiment les recommandations des experts euh, dans, no dans notre euh, euh, la communauté consultative euh, euh, pour euh, leurs recommandations avec euh, c'est quoi peut-être l'intervalle optimal après une infection pour avoir une, une, une dose de rappel. Merci. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from David Thurton, CBC News. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, yes. Good morning. How do you model for COVID, Dr. Tan? when not everyone can get a PCR test? Is it a challenge and how do you do it? Yes, um, so on the local level, it is challenging because not everybody can get a test. But um, we are doing a lot of testing in the country. So for example, some of the initial slides, you will see that uh, over 150,000 tests are being performed from a, a laboratory testing perspective, which is a good um, number for the purposes of tracking trends. So we've it reintroduced a slide on the laboratory positive uh, rate, and that, that can be one of the indicators, uh, along with others, that we can use to see where um, this wave is heading. Right now, we're in a slightly sort of gray zone, if you like, of uh, waiting to see what happens next. Um, you, you can't tell whether you've uh, really reached a peak, for example, until after the peak is um, truly over. And uh, so, so I think in interpretation of the graphs that we are showing today, uh, I just caution that that last part of the graph, uh, um, you know, data that could be incomplete, Uh, and so we need to wait a little while to see uh, if the trend continues on the downward trajectory. And as I've said, it's different in a, different parts of the country. But I think we're doing enough to appreciate the trends. Uh, but obviously, at an individual level, not everyone would know for sure whether they got Omicron. But the other uh, rule of thumb we're, we're telling people is that if you had your symptoms somewhere after December the 20th, or thereabouts, you probably got Omicron and um, essentially consider yourself uh, in that uh, group. Okay, I'll just follow up because you, you mentioned that, you know, it's very hard to tell when Omicron, when this wave has peaked until it has peaked. We are hearing from Quebec's premier, Francois Legault, he said that Omicron has peaked in that province. Is there any data that you've come across to support that statement? Yes, and I think you can uh, see a number of charts even in our data at the national level, which is a composite picture. So Quebec will have um, 
will have more uh, information uh, at their level. But first of all, most likely you'll see the cases peak first before the hospitalizations and the ICU emissions. So you're seeing that pattern in the national picture. So the national picture is because Ontario and Quebec drives the national curves, uh, given the size of the population, and they were the first uh, to experience this Omicron surge, that dip in the um, case curve is perhaps indeed the trend, but we just have to wait a little while uh, to be able to confirm that. Uh, the other thing is that even if a curve comes down, it can always go up again, depending on the contacts within a population. For example, as people go back to school and, and work, uh, those cases could come back. So it won't be necessarily a smooth curve downwards. It could be a series of bumps. So um, we will likely be able to discern that uh, at the national level as well. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Boris Pou Le Devoir. À vous la parole. Euh, bonjour, ma question porte sur la diapositive numéro 12, euh, c'est-à-dire sur le, les hospitalisations prévues. Dans votre présentation, vous euh, parlez beaucoup au, euh, au futur ou au conditionnel. On pourrait voir une hausse, mais si je me fie euh, au graphique, en fait, on présente la situation entre janvier et février. Euh, donc, aux dernières nouvelles, on est en plein au milieu de ça et on est exactement au pic qui est présenté dans ce graphique. Donc, j'aimerais euh, savoir si, effectivement, on constate en ce moment qu'on est dans le scénario bleu, c'est-à-dire dans le scénario euh, où euh, le taux d'hospitalisation est diminué par rapport au variant Delta, mais qui dépasse le maximum des nouvelles admissions hospitalières. Merci pour la question. C'est... C'est toujours difficile parce qu'avec uh, la, la modélisation, c'est toujours, comme dire, uh, c'est basé sur les, les, les données, données on a actuellement. Et c'est n'est pas comme une, une boule de cristal parce que on, on, toujours on contrôle nos, uh, c est, c est, uh, son propre destin. Uh, et, et, et donc, je pense que uh, si on, on, on continue avec uh, la, la, la tendance, peut-être avec les, les mesures de santé publique en, en, en vigueur aussi, uh, avec uh, une bonne comme dit, augmentation de couverture vaccinale, c'est toujours uh, uh, possible. Après, uh, peut-être un déclin des, des cas signalés, que toujours comme, un, comme dit, un, un indicateur tardif, on va voir un, un impact sur les taux d'hospitalisation. Donc, je pense, euh, d'après moi, c'est un peu tôt à prononcer exactement euh, qu'est-ce qui va se passer où on est actuellement. C'est toujours une question de, de suivre étroit, étroitement les données probantes et les cas, mais aussi euh, euh, les, 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 les taux d'hospitalisation aussi, même les admissions aux soins intensifs euh, pour, pour voir c'est quoi les impacts euh, sur le système de soins de santé. Donc, si je comprends bien votre réponse, ça prendrait une boule de cristal, même pour voir la situation actuelle des choses, d'accord? Euh, je vais tenter une, une réponse très précise, une question très précise. Euh, à Montréal, on dit, ou au Québec, on dit que le, le pic est passé des, des, de hausse des cas, c'est-à-dire on a atteint en ce moment, ou peut-être dans les prochains jours, le pic de la hausse des, des nouveaux cas euh, de COVID-19. Est-ce qu'il y a une crédibilité, selon vous? Est-ce que vos, votre scénario confirme un peu cette, cette prétention? OK. Sûrement peut-être pour répondre aussi. On n'a pas une, une boule de cristal. Personne n'a une boule de cristal euh, parmi euh, les autorités de la santé publique. Euh, moi, c'est difficile pour moi de prononcer qu -ce, euh, qu ce qui se passe actuellement au Québec parce que c'est sûr que les autorités de la santé publique au Québec ont, ont les, 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 les données les plus comme dit, précises euh, comparées à ce qu'on a reçu ici à l'échelle euh, nationale fédérale. Euh, donc, si euh, les, les autorités euh, de la santé publique à Montréal et au Québec euh, voient peut-être que, que avec les tendances que les, les cas signalés commencent à diminuer, peut-être qu'on a peut-être dépassé le pic. Oui, c'est possible que, oui, on va voir dans quelques semaines aussi un déclin avec les taux d'hospitalisation aussi, parce que on, on sait que euh, normalement, si la, 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 les proportions des, des personnes atteintes avec la COVID-19 euh, vont continuer à avoir, comme dit, 
euh, ont, besoin, ont besoin d'hospitalisation. Euh, C'est peut-être optimiste de voir okay, avec un déclin des cas signalés, si c'est vraiment c'est une bonne comme il dit euh, euh, une bonne tendance euh, à, 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 si ça continue peut-être euh, on va avoir un impact mais pour moi c'est difficile à prononcer euh, et c'est mieux de, de, de vraiment euh, aller aux autorités de santé publique de Québec. Thank you, merci. The next question is from Abigail Beeman, Global News. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi there. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, as you note, several provinces are starting to give more detailed data on hospital admissions. Uh, using Ontario as an example, we now know nearly half of people included in COVID hospitalizations were actually admitted for another reason but tested positive. Um, I'm wondering if this is the first time you're including that national look of people who were admitted to hospital uh, because of COVID versus for another reason. What benefits or drawbacks do you see in this kind of reporting? And also, does it suggest hospitals may be less stretched compared to a non-COVID regular year now that we have this additional information. Yes, Teresa Tam. So as you said, many uh, jurisdictions are now trying to discern whether someone is hospitalized because of COVID or that they also have COVID and they're admitted for something else. I think that's useful um, in the study of the impact of the Omicron variant, but for the hospitals themselves, They are pretty full and they, they, hospitals have always been uh, very stretched during the winter months in any case. And so this really uh, doesn't help at all uh, having a massive Omicron surge. What I'm seeing is that even if you say, so, so think of only a proportion of cases uh, uh, in the hospitals directly because of Omicron, um, the The numbers that I'm seeing um, of hospitalizations being reported, even if you have that, it's still much higher uh, and, and getting that to, to be higher than the other peaks that we've seen in the other waves. That's, that's just the comparison. So even if only a proportion of them are there because of Omicron, it's still a huge number of cases. The other parameters that we are trying to discern from the province is the length of stay and then also the pro clinical progression inside the hospitals. So far, what we've been hearing is that the length of stay seems to be shorter for the Omicron um, variant um, cases that we're seeing after December and also that um, for the ICU um, emissions, um, You know, there, there seems to be less uh, of those, but still over uh, 884 daily critical care bed use is huge. Um, so that, I, I guess the bottom line is this variant is having a very significant impact on the hospitalizations. But the other thing that's very different is that, of course, staff are getting sick at the same time. So that is putting a lot of pressure on the hospital systems. It's Dr. New. I, I, maybe I could just add uh, one additional point, and, and that's the fact that, uh, you know, we are teasing out with obviously our counterparts in the provinces and territories in terms of hospitalizations. They say, you know, because of COVID-19 or sort of just an incidental finding of uh, someone sort of uh, went to hospital for, for another reason, maybe elective surgery and so on. But the, 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 the bottom line, really, if you're on the ground, is that it still has a tremendous impact in terms of uh, the strain on human resources. Because if you do find it as, quote, an incidental finding, someone with a uh, COVID-19 in the hospital setting, you know, the staff, et cetera, you have to take other precautions and the measures, et cetera, to try to prevent, obviously, onward spread. So, uh, like I say, even if, like I say, it's not a, a, a direct impact in, in terms of having to deal with a COVID-19 uh, case that uh, is in there because of, of serious uh, consequences uh, because of, of the, the virus itself, there's still obviously a, a knock-on effect in terms of the, the impacts of, of just finding, uh, you know, the COVID-19 uh, sort of, uh, you know, the virus uh, Uh, with other uh, admissions to hospitals. So uh, overall, uh, as we've been repeating, uh, the strain on our healthcare system is 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 uh, is tremendous. And I think uh, as much as we can do, uh, all of us individually, collectively, to decrease the pressure uh, on on the hospital system. Uh, you know, our, our exhausted healthcare workers on the front line. I think that's really what we need to be focusing on. Thank you.
Thanks. That's really helpful. Um, I also wanted to ask about the information um, in your notes about uh, children, uh, infants being seven times more likely to be hospitalized than children under five. I'm wondering uh, if you can shed more light on what we know about infant and under five hospitalizations. Is this higher or different than in previous waves? And also, do we know uh, whether these infants uh, and young children, uh, generally speaking, have other underlying conditions? Yes, thank you uh, for the question. So the rates are still um, uh, low in children, but because of the massive number of cases in our communities, uh, we do expect the the actual numbers to be higher than in preceding waves. So I think that that was expected, but the absolute numbers are still quite low. Uh, we've been checking in with a network of all the pediatric hospitals to ask them what they're seeing. And um, so in general, um, the cases are not um, very severe, but of, of course, severe enough to be uh, hospitalized. Infants, no matter what respiratory virus you get, are likely to be more severely impacted. Um, and so I think that's not unusual. So any infants under one year of age uh, are often uh, experience more severe outcomes from uh, respiratory viruses. Um, so there, there's a number of, I think, important things to consider for kids, of course, to protect younger children, um, especially because they're not eligible for vaccines. The adults around them and the guardians need to up the game in terms of getting themselves protected through vaccinations and boosters and masking and all the other layers of protection to protect them. But one other really important point to make is um, vaccination during pregnancy. So this is very important for protecting uh, the individual who's pregnant, but also the infants, both of whom are at high risk of severe outcomes. So vaccination with a mRNA and COVID vaccine is strongly recommended and research shows that vaccination during pregnancy triggers the development of protective antibodies that can also be passed on to that young infant and provide that infant with a level of protection. Thank you. Merci. The next question, la prochaine question est de Raphaël Pirot, Agence QMI. À vous la parole. Oui, bonjour. Euh, écoutez, je vais euh, je veux vous demander, euh, par rapport au programme de, de collecte de données de géolocalisation, je voulais savoir exactement euh, qu'est-ce que la santé publique fait avec ces données. Euh, donc, précisément, à quoi ça sert de collecter toutes les données de géolocalisation des Canadiens au niveau de la modélisation? OK. Merci pour la question. Euh, moi, je peux commencer. Peut-être Dr. Tam a quelque chose à ajouter. Euh, premièrement, je peux vous dire que on prend pour, vraiment pour les sérieux la, la confidentialité, euh, la, la, la vie privée des, 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 des individus. Ça, c'est très important. Euh, ce qu'on collecte, c'est toujours avec les, les données, c'est toujours à l'échelle de la population. C'est pas vraiment pour les individus. Et c'est notre comme outil pour... Euh, Uh, aussi pour aider à, 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 à évaluer, montrer c'est quoi les, les mesures de santé publique. Est-ce que est-ce que ça peut aider pour uh, peut-être indiquer uh, peut-être uh, si le, le taux des cas uh, peut-être uh, peuvent augmenter, uh, peut-être lié avec uh, la, 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 comme dit, uh, le taux de ou la, 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 la mobilisation, le, le, les mouvements de, de, de la population. Ça, c'est en, en général, c'est une, une aide, mais c'est toujours pour assurer que c'est jamais avec notre collecte de données à, à, à l'échelle de de, de, des individus. Merci. Et euh, deuxième question sur un autre sujet. En Espagne, euh, la santé publique a lancé un appel à euh, traiter le, la vague de micron une fois que le pic sera passé euh, comme une grippe normale. Donc, euh, si j'ai bien compris, c'est ce, ce que la santé publique là-bas propose. Euh, ça fait beaucoup réagir. Je voulais savoir, est-ce qu'on peut dire la même chose ici au Canada? Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de ça? Euh, et on parle toujours, évidemment, à la fin de, de, de la vague Omicron, là, ou une fois que le pic sera dépassé. Merci pour la question. Je pense que c'est un peu... 
tôt pour prononcer est-ce que c'est est semblable à qu ce qui se passe avec euh, le variant Omicron et le COVID-19 en général comparé à, à la grippe et l'influenza. On voit maintenant actuellement avec, avec le taux d'hospitalisation, euh, avec la morbidité, mortalité, que c'est vraiment... C est, c est, c est, ça mis, euh, ça, il y a beaucoup de pression sur notre système de santé. Donc, je pense euh, après, peut-être on espère après euh, la, 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 la vague d'Omicron, on va voir c'est euh, qu -ce que c'est quoi les prochaines étapes avec euh, la vaccination, avec toutes les mesures de santé publique. C'est quelque chose, euh, on va toujours suivre euh, la, la science et les données probantes pour, 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 pour avancer à les prochaines étapes. Qu'est-ce qu'on va faire ici comme une société? Mais pour l'instant, on est encore dans le feu d'action, on peut dire, et, et c'est quelque chose, il faut réagir maintenant avec la situation actuelle et on va voir après qu'est-ce qu'on qu qu va faire avec, avec les, 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 tous les outils disponibles pour combattre contre le COVID-19. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Marika Walsh from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi there. Thanks so much for taking our questions. I wanted to go back to what Boris was asking earlier about the peak, because looking at the slides, um, it quite clearly shows the way that's being projected and modeled is that we're essentially in the peak now. We're about to hit the peak for hospitalization and that we've already hit the peak for cases. And then the slide title says a surge is coming in the next week. And so I'm just confused about what you're saying. I understand that you can only say with certainty that we are, we've hit the peak after it's over, but it seems to be showing based on the data that you actually do believe that we are now at the peak based on available data. Is that correct or is that incorrect? Um, it's Teresa Tam. I'll, I'll take that question. I think the next week is actually re quite important. I, we received a number of questions today about, well, in certain local areas, have they reached a peak? What about Quebec? I think uh, a number of provinces, the, the biggest ones, put it this way, who uh, have particularly experienced the, the uh, Omicron surge the fastest, uh, the earliest, um, are seeing some stabilization at a very high level, but some stabilization in the daily case rates. So I think this is the early signal that we could be approaching that peak. Uh, all I'm saying is that there's a gray zone or a zone of uncertainty that you, you're seeing in uh, either the projections, but also in the actual uh, case trends. So I think um, come back in about a week, we'll probably have a little bit more information as well. But it is quite possible that in the next days that we'll see that, um, you know, peak at least in the cases, the hospitalizations. Um, what I would say is that what the modelers did is that they inputted certain assumptions, uh, like how many days after a case declares itself would they get hospitalized. Those assumptions may or may not be completely Uh, aligned with reality and the range. So you're seeing that uncertainty being depicted. I think the models are there to, I guess, um, assist with planning purposes in terms of whether it would exceed uh, previous hospital uh, intake. And so I, I think um, all of this though does align together with the international data to say that we could be like others, seeing a sharp, sharp increase and then it coming down fairly fast. But I think we're all just wanting to be a bit cautious about pronouncing on that until we've seen more information. Okay, thank you so much for clarifying that. I also wanted to go back to your comments um, at, the, at the beginning where you said that if you had symptoms on or, around, or, on or after December 20th, assume you had Omicron. Earlier this week, we saw Alberta say that they believe their actual case count is 10 times higher than the reported number. What is PHAC's estimate of the true case count in Canada? Is it 10 times higher across the country? Or what is the sort of guesstimate that you are working on? Well, I think um, if you see one of the forecast curves, you see those little orange points. Um, it's 
is the actual number of reported cases through surveillance. Um, our previous models, the, the little red dots or other plots that we've had, followed the projections pretty well. And now it doesn't really. So I think the number of cases are likely to be much higher. But it could be different in different provinces. We've seen that even with the other waves where in in fact, Canada was quite good at capturing most cases, and we, we backed it up through um, serial surveys where we look at antibody levels. Yes, you only get the tip of the iceberg, but we got quite a large tip of the iceberg um, compared to maybe some other countries. Right now, I can't tell you at the national level what that means. I think the serial surveys um, that will be conducted over time particularly, I think, at the end of this wave will tell us um, maybe how much of the population did get infected in the end. Uh, but I, I do think that it could be different uh, in different jurisdictions, and some of it might depend on their um, capacity for testing at any given moment. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Alex Ballengal, Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, thank you very much. Um, just on testing, uh, we've heard from some experts uh, questioning whether, given you know the prevalence of Omicron, uh, testing capacity in the provinces, how we don't know the actual true number of cases, that it's making less and less sense to uh, put so many uh, so much resources into testing incoming travelers. Uh, so I wonder, Dr. Tam, what you think about that. Is, is this Omicron way of different, and does it still make sense to put, you know, I don't know what the budget is, I think it's $600 million towards testing uh, people coming into the country? Yes, yeah, so um, as you say, in the domestic sense, uh, tracking every case isn't, um, you know, really necessary for a surveillance perspective. And But while it may important for certain individuals. Um, I think at, at the border, um, it's not just the uh, Omicron-related detection that we are trying to do. Is you know, We're there also to um, detect any other new variant or mixes of variants. Uh, but at the moment, when the whole world has Omicron, our next-door neighbor has Omicron for the most part, um, you're right in that uh, we could do uh, sampling um, for the tests uh, instead of testing uh, maybe every single vaccinated individuals coming from um, other countries. But we will evaluate that over time. It is a capacity um, drain on the systems as a whole. So we've been trying to um, look at that and, and balance it out. At the moment, of course, uh, we are... Um, you know, continuing um, the trajectory that we have laid out in terms of traveler testing, uh, but we should evaluate that over time. But what is really important for the border is a really good random sample where you are not just following Omicron, but following the other variants. Um, so just to clarify, so do you, have you brought that up in your advice that this is maybe something where the, the resources being put to use could be better utilized elsewhere? Is that something that you guys are actually looking at, changing that uh, practice? Um, I think we're always evaluating this with our laboratory colleagues, and we haven't as yet had to uh, make a shift. But if necessary, I think, um, you know, we would consider it. Um, there is, um, I think, um, for the sequencing, though, uh, it is something that we are um, looking at because you don't have to sequence every case anymore. It is all Omicron. <laughs> so we were sequencing every single traveler. We don't think that is actually needed or viable. The genomics capacity can be utilized in different other ways. Uh, there's also staff absenteeism and other things. So um, I uh, think my advice would be not to have to sequence every single traveler case. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from uh, Ryan Tumulty, National Post. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Tam, you talked a little bit about uh, estimates of how much the um, 
cases actually exceed the the publicized daily case count and and some of the other assumptions that you are making. I, I'm wondering how you're making those assumptions. Why do you assume that the case levels are that much higher than the testing? What data is driving you to that conclusion, I guess? Well, I think partly it's just um, the um, indication from the our colleagues, the other chief medical officer, that they're simply not able to test every case. So you know that to be true. That's a fact. Um, and also anyone who did a rapid antigen test, for example, that's not captured through the, for the most part, some jurisdictions are trying to do so, but a lot of it is not captured uh, through the provincial system. So we know that we're missing that part of the sort of part of the iceberg, if you like. So, um, and as you've seen from um, uh, the reports from the other chief medical officers, they, they're quite clear that they are not going to track every case. Um, we've moved on from individual case contact management uh, as soon as this resurgence became um, very significant. So you don't need that for the population level management, you're moving towards the broader messaging and you can't trace every contact, et cetera. So we know that to be true. And is this a part, even with the other ways, as I said, in retrospectively looking at the serologic surveys, we know that we only detect the tip of the iceberg. Now the uh, uh, lab testing capacity, rightly so, is directed towards those most at risk. And uh, it would be very important, uh, of course, to direct things like treatments. Um, people are looking forward to antiviral treatments, for example, and you need to make sure that the tests are directed towards those. So there is no doubt that we are underestimate the cases. Having said that, though, our, our focus of attention should be more uh, looking at the hospital trends and the severity indicators. The case trends gives you a signal because it's the earlier signal than the lagging indicators. But really, you know, we have um, determined, and I think there's a slide that shows you the characteristic of the Omicron virus, one of which is that, um, you know, really you want to be tracking hospitalizations, ICU emissions, uh, because um, that is where um, our public health action and healthcare action is going to be. And also that the vaccines themselves, the most important aspect of the vaccine effectiveness is tracking its effectiveness against severe outcomes. I guess just as a follow-up on that, I guess I'm sort of wondering, though, how I understand that the cases are definitely higher than um, what's being reported. I'm wondering, though, how you, how you estimate how much higher um, and how you, how you, you know, you mentioned at one point that you think there may be, um, you know, at, at the peak of the wave, somewhere around 170,000 cases a day. Um, I'm just, I'm just wondering, you know, how do you decide what the multiplying factor is there? Yeah, and I think um, there's different models being used, and some of the details might be in the um, annex, but some of it is taking into account other uh, parameters such as transmissibility, the uh, R value that you've all got a bit used to, and comparing Delta to Omicron and factoring some of those um elements in, as well as there's many other injects into those models, including booster dose uptake, um, et cetera. So I think it's quite a complex, um, you know, composite of um, inputs in order to generate those curves. But those are the estimates that that's been generated by the modelers that give people a bit of an idea of uh, how high those case counts could be. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Laura Osman, the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Once again, Ms. Osman, you might be on mute. Pardon me. Sorry about that. Thanks, doctors. I wanted to ask you about um, the data. Dr. Tam, you said that 
um, tracking every case isn't necessary for good surveillance necessarily. But it's clear that from slide five that we're losing some of the more granule data. I'm thinking particularly of um, data involving how much this is impacting kids. A lot of the public health measures are disproportionately affecting kids. You know, schools are closed, recreation is closed. Um, and so how do you make good decisions and what are your fellow uh, chief medical officers saying about how you make decisions about whether or not these measures are working when the people they affect most are not being tested? Yeah, and I think um, there is a lot of testing and there's probably enough testing to look at those trends. So you can see the disaggregation by age and how those are trending and the shifts over time between the younger adults and then really the spread of the um, cases into the other age groups. So that is actually quite easily um, detected and can be trend uh, using surveillance data at this point. We're doing a, like a million tests a week, uh, over 150,000 a day. Um, so that, that, I think, presents a reasonable data set. But it's, we, we do pay attention when the policies suddenly shift. And, and that's why I think um, looking at the composite of all the different indicators is important. The other thing is ultimately the hospitalization rates are important to track. And those tend to be, um, you know, quite um, comprehensive in terms of uh, the numbers of hospitalizations so that you can uh, have a greater certainty about. Um, I think that this aggregation uh, that's happening to further understand who is being hospitalized because of COVID, who is having their underlying medical conditions being made worse as a results of COVID are, are all very important, but it is quite um, easy for us to use hospital um, surveillance networks to trend the hospitalizations in pediatrics and the pediatric ICU admissions, for example. So I don't think we will lose track of the ability to detect any significant change in those parameters. Thank you. Um, on hospital cases, nurses have flagged that the number of people in hospital with COVID uh, who are there for other reasons may be reflecting um, in-hospital transmission, and they're really concerned about that. Is that something that you're seeing in the data, something that you're particularly concerned about? Yes. Yeah, so again, I think um, the details will have to be um, obtained from the local jurisdictions. But yes, there's in fact different categories of uh, cases that are hospitalized, some of whom actually did acquire um, COVID as part of a uh, acute care outbreak. So those are happening. Um, those outbreaks are being tracked. Um, and it, it, it could be due to a number of factors um, sometimes as to uh, what the, the dynamics are in terms of the spread uh, in healthcare settings. But it really does continue to stress the need for uh, good infection prevention control practices. But it's been very, very difficult. I mean, I think healthcare workers, no matter how hard they try, like the rest of the population in minimizing their risk, this is such a transmissible virus that we have to all up our game everywhere, um, including mask wearing, et cetera, ventilation and everything else in order to reduce those risks. So, um, but yes, healthcare re setting related outbreaks are something that we should do everything to try and minimize. Thank you, merci. La prochaine question de Marie Chabot Johnson, Radio Canada. À vous la parole, please go ahead. Merci. Euh, si on n'est pas capable encore quand même de dire qu'on est, on atteint le sommet de la courbe pour Omicron, euh, je comprends qu'il y a encore une incertitude par rapport aux données. Est-ce qu'on devrait tout de même essayer de, de, de garder les mesures sanitaires en place le temps qu'on sache si on est passé la courbe? Euh, alors que certaines juridictions comme au Québec qui ont décidé de euh, d'enlever le couvre-feu, par exemple. C'est Dr. New, merci pour la question. J'ai un peu de difficulté à peut-être entendre avec un peu d'écho, mais euh, si je comprends bien, c'est toujours oui. Ça, c'est euh, 
Euh, L'enjeu actuel pour euh, les autorités de la santé publique et les décideurs dans euh, chaque juridiction comme le Québec, euh, il faut suivre euh, les, 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 les données euh, de, de, de surveillance, mais aussi euh, euh, liées avec les mesures de santé publique. Euh, Ce n'est pas pour moi pour prononcer qu ce qui se passe au Québec avec leurs données et euh, la, leur euh, propre décision euh, pour, euh, pour les, les mesures de santé publique. Euh, vous avez euh, à parler de le, le couvre-feu. Euh, ce, que, ce que je peux vous dire, que je, je comprends qu'au Québec et dans n'importe quelle province et territoire, c'est très important de, 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 de voir c'est quoi les impacts sur les, les, les taux d'hospitalisation euh, comme un indicateur tardif, mais aussi c'est lié avec, euh, avec les cas signalés dans, dans, dans la province. Si euh, les autorités... Euh, euh, ce qu'on voit maintenant, euh, voir que peut-être euh, il y a un plateau ou peut-être le, le cas signalé euh, commence à diminuer. Euh, euh, peut-être un peu, peut-être euh, lâcher quelques mesures de santé publique, mais c'est vraiment pour le, les décideurs à, 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 à prendre des décisions comme ça. Et aussi, c'est toujours une question d'être flexible et s'ajuster euh, comme nécessaire si euh, peut-être la courbe épidémique commence euh, à, à, à aller dans une mauvaise direction. Et euh, on voit bientôt le Canada va mettre en, en place euh, euh, sa politique pour euh, bloquer l'accès aux camionneurs étrangers non vaccinés puis demander la quarantaine pour les camionneurs canadiens qui sont vaccinés. À votre avis, quel impact est-ce que ça va avoir sur la santé publique? Est-ce que ça va avoir un, un, un impact concret? Oui, ben pour moi, c'est toujours l'objectif pour la santé publique en général pour le Canada. C'est oui, on va augmenter notre couverture vaccinale le plus haut possible. Et les camionneurs qui, qui sont les Canadiens font partie de notre population générale de notre société. Et donc, je pense que c'est très important d'encourager l'adoption des vaccins pour toute la population. Donc, je, on sait qu'il y a des, des enjeux, peut-être des impacts dans n'importe quel secteur pour, comme dit, l'infrastructure et aussi le fonctionnement de notre société. Mais je pense, en général, euh, je pense que pour n'importe quel secteur, il faut euh, continuer avec euh, toutes euh, tout, euh, les mesures, euh, tous les outils, euh, euh, l'éducation, tout ça, pour euh, augmenter euh, l'adoption des vaccins. Parce que c'est ce, ce, les, les données à, à date euh, démontrent clairement que les, les vaccins sont sûrs et efficaces pour la protection là, des, 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 des personnes, mais aussi, aussi pour, se, pour se protéger, euh, euh, pas seulement contre la, la contamination, mais aussi contre les maladies graves. Mais aussi, c'est aussi des bénéfices pour les, les proches, aussi les autres personnes dans la communauté. Donc, on, on continue avec nos efforts d'augmenter la couverture vaccinale en général. This question is for Dr. Tam. Um, I You've already mentioned a few times that healthcare systems across the across the country are having a very difficult time. New Brunswick brought in new restrictions today because of concerns about its own healthcare system really approaching a crisis. Uh, I want to know, in practical terms, what do provinces have to prepare for when they look at the um, forecast for hospitalizations, even at the low end here with say 2000 cases uh, of new hospital admissions daily, you know, are we concerned about overflowing or uh, tapped out ICU resources? Uh, are, is, are there enough, um, uh, you know, uh, in, intubation and respirators, let's say, you know, are, what, what practical impact will these forecasts have on healthcare systems across the country? What do provinces need to prepare for? Yes, and we're not, obviously not the only ones doing forecasting. It's been done at uh, the provincial and other levels as well. So it's always better to prepare and prepare ahead for the, the worst case scenarios. Um, I think we this is not the um, first time we're going through this. And it's very important to have um, approaches to um, look at how you can um, continue Uh, your acute care system and 
many jurisdictions, of course, uh, have tried uh, reducing elective procedures, having surge beds, even building you know, additional beds and field hospitals. And all of that it has been in the uh, preparedness uh, scenarios that's already been, been done. Um, I mean, obviously, we've been looking at supplies. There's definitely enough ventilators. Um, the ICU rate isn't going up as high as the hospitalization rates. Um, so looking at that very carefully is important. Um, we are sharing information on length of stay and that type of thing across the jurisdictions because that's really important to know how long someone stays because that has a significant impact on how you project your hospital capacity. So all of that information is being shared across federal, provincial, territorial tables to inform the provinces that might be coming a little bit later than, than the initial ones. So those have been, I think, the mo most practical ways of doing this. But the other thing is factoring in staff absenteeism. So I think uh, that's almost the most difficult rate limiting step for jurisdictions right now. And as a result, um, they are uh, doing more uh, population-based measure to reduce contacts because it's not just about um, getting enough beds, it's about getting enough human resource and protecting the healthcare workers uh, in their communities. I'll just take a, a follow-up question here. Um, uh, can you give us an estimated percentage of Cases. I know we. I know that testing isn't exactly, um, you know, uh, as widespread as it once was during this pandemic. But you know, is it safe to assume that all of these new cases are Omicron, or is Delta still making up a percentage of the cases across the country, or even other variants? Yes. So right now. Um we don't really need to sequence every single case. As I've said, you know, you, you need a sample of them and the vast majority are Omicron. Um, at the same time, you know, there's always a very small number of other, um, other genomic uh, sequencing that we're detecting. But right now, um, the Omicron variant is absolutely the majority. And that is being seen in every jurisdiction now. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Dylan Robertson, the Winnipeg Free Press. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Good morning, doctors. Uh, I'd like to discuss incidental COVID-19 in hospitals, as it seems that this is not being consistently reported by the provinces. Are you providing any guidance to medical officers on how to parse primary versus incidental infection? And is SPAC recommending provinces do this analysis, or is the value of this data totally at the province's discretion? Uh, it's Teresa Tam. So this is an actual technical area that we've discussed in our uh, federal provincial territory tables at the SAC and the chief medical officers and our technical groups. So um, provinces, it is definitely the most useful for the provinces. At the same time, at the sort of national level, it is still useful for us to know um, uh, that parameter. I think that the difference between the Omicron and other variants is that it's just so pervasive that um, you could very well come in because of something else and you have Omicron. So that's the slight difference between this variant and others. Um, and I, I think sometimes it does help with uh, local level planning, uh, but it's much more important uh, for provincial levels. But we are sharing uh, how uh, the methodology, put it this way, of how provinces are trying to um, discern that difference. And the way that they um, try to disaggregate that information varies as well. And um, a lot a lot of effort has been put in. Some of it is an actual manual case review. That's how much effort it takes to get at that information. Now, once you know, uh, you know, you, you have a bit of an estimate. I'm not entirely certain that it's worthwhile just keep doing it all the time, but that's up to the local jurisdiction to uh, decide. But we are sharing the methodologies on... Um, how that is done. And, and as just, as I've just said, 
Some of it is also this aggregating the ones acquired inside the hospital um, as well. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Tam, certain provinces say it's up to individuals to protect themselves from COVID. They're abandoning attempts to limit the spread and instead focusing on avoiding the worst outcomes. But is it actually possible for everyone to protect themselves given the disparities that you've reported on in public health? Yes, yeah, so getting uh, equitable access to layers of protection is always uh, a concern. So I do think that at the federal level, uh, you know, one of our roles is trying to, as I said, level the playing field as much as we can. So I think having social supports is important. Um, you know, some of the policies in terms of uh, supports to individuals at the lower socioeconomic uh, strata or small businesses, and that's not within our realm of um, um, policy decision-making, um, but it is very important. And of course, one of the federal roles is to support Indigenous communities, and I believe um, uh, Indigenous Services Canada had provided an update on some of those measures as well. We're also concerned about the distribution of rapid tests to uh, those who may have um, needs but can't access. So through the Red Cross and uh, mechanisms and other um, uh, NGOs distributing rapid tests. And I actually think in you know, distributing uh, good, high quality uh, masks, for example, uh, to um, Populations experiencing equity um, disparities is is actually important as well. It is, is this, of course, certain workplaces. Um, I think uh, making sure that employ employees who have to be on site to work, unlike a number of us who can telework, um, is is also extremely important, and making sure that they have everything that they need to protect themselves. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Wyatt Sharp from the Wyatt Sharp Show. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Um, hi there. Um, just one question to start off as it relates to COVID treatment, specifically um, Pfizer's um, pill to treat COVID. Obviously, it's not yet approved by Health Canada. Uh, I'm just wondering, though, if it does get approved by Health Canada, what kind of an impact that will have on, for example, future modeling, like the modeling you presented today, what kind of an impact that could have on future hospitalizations, and, and if you even have a sense of that yet. Yes, so uh, for modeling purposes, it could be something that uh, we can factor in. The uh, benefits of Paxlovid, as demonstrated through clinical trials, is to reduce uh, severe outcomes like hospitalizations in those at high risk. Those initial clinical trials were done in unvaccinated populations as well. Um, once we get a medication, trying to get some data uh, on its impact post-authorization is important, and those kind of data will help uh, um, inputs into models. So one might postulate that a model that estimates X number of cases could end up in a hospital. Well, if you had a treatment that could present, prevent some of that, uh, that can potentially be affected in. But I think this is a little too soon. I think Canada is fortunate in being probably one of the first countries in the world to access um, these medications. But there is a global supply constraint. Um, it may not be in widespread use for, for a while. So um, I'm not certain when uh, that would be significant enough uh, to factor in to the model. Um, but I think overall, uh, if we do see the proportion of people who get COVID um, not, um, yeah, and, and, you know, the rates of hospitalization, that, that's still um, an important uh, indicator to trend over time for sure. But uh, not not just now, <laughs> but I think later on uh, it could be factored in. And is is there enough evidence yet to show 
um, you know, which people would best to give this treatment to, because you just mentioned that if it does get approved by Health Canada, there will be limited supply of it. So is there any idea of, you know, once it does get approved, it should be prioritized, or is that just, once again, something else that's kind of just remains up in the air up until it is approved by Health Canada, and if? Well, I think we're trying to line up uh, um, all of the different uh, tools and supports provinces might need um, to help them with implementation. So uh, um, I think what we're trying to do at the Public Health Agency is to convene experts to help uh, provide some considerations uh, as to how the initial supplies could be prioritized, much as we did uh, at the beginning of getting our initial doses of vaccines. So that work is underway as well. Alors, c'est ce qui met fin à cette conférence de presse. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being with us. Thank you, doctors, for your time. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you.